Ladies and gentlemen, it's afraid. Now, what do I mean by that? We've talked a lot about the Leviathan on the show. We've talked a lot about the march through the institutions and how it feels increasingly in this country as if institutions that we used to love or at the very least respected have all been co-opted by an ideology or a worldview that doesn't seem to make any sense. And it seems to just getting more and more extreme as time goes on. And as it's gotten more extreme, it only seems to get more powerful. And so it has seemed like this insurmountable contest that we're, we're engaged in, right? this insurmountable enemy, this challenge that we can't seem to get ahead of or to chop down at all. And increasingly what we're told is we'll just vote harder and that'll fix it. And intuitively, we know it won't. We know it's not enough. And we've been looking for, for some sort of hope, some sort of glimmer uh, of a chance that we could win. What this episode is about is laying out exactly why I not only think we can win, I think it's now become highly probable. And the craziest part about all of it is it's them that are showing us exactly how to do it. All of that and more coming up on this episode of Making the Argument brought to you by Good Ranchers. There are a lot of things that we could talk about that wouldn't be the happiest of topics, but I'm here to tell you that that is not what today's episode is about. It's going to be very encouraging. I'm excited for it. I know this has been inspired by many different posts in our community chat, and if you would like to play a role in helping us define what the future of this podcast looks like, you can join our community chat at the link in the description, go to the Introduce Yourself channel, get to know everyone, and we look forward to meeting you there. Okay, as always, I am your host, Nick Freitas. Unfortunately, my beautiful bride, Tina, queen of the bees, cannot be here today, but she will be arriving back in Virginia this week, and so we're excited to have her back in studio here shortly. We do, however, have our resident historian and political prognosticator, Christian Hines. How are you doing, sir? I'm really excited for this episode. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then, of course, we have our producer of producers, Nicholas Hamilton, the good Hamilton, the one that doesn't like central banking. How are you doing, man? I'm doing very well, Nick. Real quick, we had a great weekend at the Homesteader at a Homesteaders conference in North Carolina, didn't we? No, no, it was excellent. In fact, I'm a little bit sunburnt right now, and that's entirely why. But if you go on to uh, Instagram or YouTube, we got some posts out there talking a little bit about it. Met a lot of great people out there. And uh, actually, a lot of the inspiration for this show uh, consisted of Christian and I taking a seven-hour drive back from the Homesteaders conference up to Virginia and discussing things and, and really trying to dig on some of these issues. And honestly, the, the more, there's a lot of conversations that Christian and I have that end with both of us feeling kind of a little bit depressed about what's going on in the world. This is not one of them. The more we were talking about this and the more we were talking about these institutions and things that they have revealed over the last couple of years, the more we started to realize like we've, we've got this. And, and I'm sitting here, and, and as we're talking about it, we're, we're talking about these categories of the Leviathan, right? So we're talking about the arts and entertainment, academia, um, the media, big tech, Wall Street, political bureaucracy. We're talking about all these things. And as we're discussing what they did and the response that's taking place in the culture and how they're responding to that response, I sat there and I looked at Christian. I'm like, have you ever seen Rocky IV, the one where he fights the right? He goes, yeah. I said, do you remember that, that moment? Because the, the, first, the first round or two, he's just getting pummeled. He's just getting beaten up. And you're thinking to yourself, there's no way he pulls this off, right? There's no way he pulls this off. And then all of a sudden, Rocky gets this, this hit off. And he hits the Russian in the face. And all of a sudden, you hear, the Russians cut. The Russians cut. And he just starts going after him, right? And, it, and it's a, a battle royale. The bell rings. He goes back to his corner. And his trainer comes in there. He's like, do you see? Do you see? He's not a machine. He's a man. He's a man. And all of a sudden, it's this moment where it's like, oh, my gosh, this can be done. This can be done. And that's what I was feeling like as, as, we, were, as we were discussing this, these issues. And that's why we're doing a whole podcast on it, because there has been a lot of discussion. And, and we, always try to, we always try to add a component of, you know, we can fight back and you have to fight back. And, and even if you don't think you can win, you got to fight back. But as we were discussing this, one of the things I realized is they're going to lose. They are, they are going to lose, and they've showed us how to beat them. So let's go, let's go ahead and jump into this. We're going to talk about those, those six categories, right? We're going to start off with the arts and entertainment because this is one area where, honestly, if you think about it, everybody's been really frustrated about what Disney has been doing and what Hollywood's been doing. We had Nerd Roddick on here, Gary, Gary Beaker from Nerd Roddick, great guy. Great channel. Go in and check it out. But we were discussing with him the things that have been happening over the last like three to four years, especially within Hollywood. I mean, you can go back further, 
But it's over the last three to four years, we, we've watched as like beloved IPs, things that are, are important to American culture. And, and some people, and sometimes conservatives will look at things within arts and entertainment and say, well, that's not that important. Well, no, arts and entertainment play a very critical role in shaping culture. And we were talking about things like, you know, Star Wars. Like, why did we like Star Wars? Why was Star Wars such, not just a, an American phenomenon, but an international phenomenon? And it's this classic case of like good versus evil. And you have these great character arcs and you have Luke Skywalker, who's kind of the bratty kid, right? That goes through some really, really tough stuff in order to become, you know, a Jedi. And you got Han Solo, who's kind of like the rogue that doesn't really care about anybody but himself. And over time, he really cares about the people within the rebellion and fighting back against it. And again, it just seems overwhelming, but they're rising up and they're fighting. And then Disney buys it from Lucasfilms and destroys it. And destroys it. And and maybe there's people out there that say, well, who cares? I'll tell you why I cared. And and this was something that I learned listening to Nerdrotic. And I learned watching uh, another show called Critical Drinker. Again, I can't always recommend his language, but he does some really interesting and funny analysis. And they were talking about, you know, look, it, it wasn't just that it was bad writing. right? There's, there's plenty of movies out there that, that are bad writing or that you don't like it as much. Or maybe the characters are not intriguing as, as you would like. And that might be frustrating, but it's not insulting. Um, the last couple of, of movies within Star Wars, they weren't just bad writing. They were insulting, and it was deliberate. They, they, weren't, they weren't just being lazy, or they weren't just trying to put out another movie to make money without really caring about how to write it. No, there was an agenda there. And you could tell the agenda when it wasn't good enough for them to give us these new characters that we were all just supposed to fall in love with that... You know, their only flaw was they didn't believe in themselves enough, right? They call this the Mary Sue caricature of, of a character. It wasn't good enough that they brought us these new characters with no character arc, with no nothing that, that fit with what they call the message. It was that they had to destroy the older characters that we all grew up with and that we all kind of loved, right? They had, to, they had to turn Han Solo into a deadbeat dad. They had to turn Luke Skywalker into basically a quitter who just ran away from everything he was supposed to have believed in. And if you think about that, if you think about how they've done this in other shows as well, the Lord of the Rings is a good example. Um, you know, some of the, the Marvel and, and DC comics, some of the movies that have gone with that, there's always this idea of they're going to tear down these iconic things that we used to appreciate in, in large part because there was an underlying message and philosophy in there. And if you looked at those stories, it wasn't just about Batman. It wasn't just about, you know, a couple of hobbits trying to destroy a ring. It wasn't just about, you know, lightsaber battles. There, there was a certain moral philosophy that was, was in there. And it wasn't always perfect. But they were giving us people that we could relate to. And, and one of the messages was about standing up for what was right and overcoming challenges. And sometimes failing because guess what? You weren't adequate. You weren't adequate. You weren't up to the challenge when it first uh, uh, presented itself to you, but, but through trial and error and training and, and probably most of all sticking with something that you believed in, even when it looked like the chips were down and all the odds were against you. That was, that was a very important component of all of this. And they destroyed these characters in order to offer us new ones that quite frankly, nobody was interested in. And I think we all need to understand that when you talk about like the Lord of the Rings, when you talk about star Wars, when you talk about some of the, these were IPs, right? These were, these were not just movies. They were kind of like traditions. And I honestly believe that they picked them on purpose because they thought they were too big to fail. They thought that this was a perfect mechanism to kill all of our old heroes and the philosophies that came with those heroes and to add us new ones that were created in this new image, this, this new kind of leftist ideology. And what they found out was no you could fail with that because people didn't want it. And it wasn't just that men didn't want it. Women didn't want it either. And they tried to turn on the fans, right? They tried to turn on the fans. Like, this is all just a bunch of racist, horrible, no good fans. And, you know, they're not true Star Wars fans. They're not true Lord of the Rings fans. And what we ended up finding out was like, oh, my gosh. Hollywood, through some of the biggest, most popular movies out there, tried to completely rewrite them in their own progressive image. And instead of making billions of dollars of people just accepting it, they not only failed to show up to the movies to watch this stuff, they actually created an entire counter to it 
which has now become its own industry. I'm not giving my money to Disney. I'm giving my money to Nerdrotic, right? Like, I don't want to watch the crap Disney's giving me. I'd rather watch Nerdrotic break it down and do his analysis, not only because it's informative, but because it's genuinely entertaining. And one of the things that we talked about here was, you know, if, if there was any group kind of like within the private sector of culture that I think most people thought was just, again, too big to fail, too powerful, how do we possibly compete? Disney, Hollywood, and now look what's going on. They're collapsing. I, they're getting crushed. They're getting crushed by Angel Studios, right? They're getting crushed by people on YouTube. One of the things Gary and I, I talked about on this, and this is so encouraging to me. Um, it, Gary was saying, he goes, Nick, between AI, camera phones, and you know social media, YouTube, you're going to start to see independent people with very, very little equipment but a good idea and a lot of passion coming up with entertainment on places like YouTube as well as others that are going to be able to effectively compete with multi-million dollar and, and what Hollywood is at now is like it's hundreds of millions of dollars uh, of you know production um, because Hollywood can't get their crap together and because the, the minimal man the middle management especially within Hollywood is so dedicated to this woke ideology that they're willing to push it no matter what. And now, again, you saw it with the writer's strike. You saw it with some of the actors going on strike. You saw it with everything else. They're, they are creating their own vacuum. Like, they're again, how have they showed us how to beat them? Well, they've realized that they can't, <laughs> they can't just put out whatever crap they want and expect fans to deal with it, especially when there's this emerging market that is now available that was not available 10, 15, 20 years ago. And I, I don't know. I, I think it's really encouraging. Out of all of the institutions that have made up what we've coined the, the Leviathan, they, all of them play some role in shaping culture or, or certainly shaping policy even outside of government, right? Yeah. Out of all of these, I'm the most bullish on the collapse of the current left-wing dominance over arts and entertainment. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because for a long time, the arts and entertainment was synonymous with Hollywood. Yeah. They, they were one and the same but they're not actually one and the same. Mm -hmm. And Hollywood is starting to disintegrate. Mm -hmm. It is starting to fracture. It's collapsing. And, and, and it's imploding without us actually really doing a lot of stuff other than walking away yeah. from the, the garbage content that they're producing. You brought up Disney with um, Star Wars as an example, but there's more than just that. There's so many other studios out there, like Warner Brothers is another one. There's plenty of studios out there, and Gary's talked about this, yeah. that... They've made one too many mistakes at this point, and they've alienated their own fan base. And in fact, they actually reveled in alienating their own fan base with the expectation that this wasn't somehow a free market where you need to serve your customers rather than insult your customers. Who knew that if you consistently insult your customers over and over again, that eventually they just stopped showing up? Yeah. And they thought that they were too big to fail. Where else are they going to go to get their content? I don't know. Maybe YouTube. Yeah. Maybe maybe they're going to listen to a podcast to get their content. I, maybe they'll they'll go to an independent film studio to get their content. Maybe they'll go find some other hobby that'll entertain them. And, and Gary also brought up a very important point in his interview with you, which, by the way, if you haven't watched this interview yet, I highly recommend it. I was actually in the corner of the room listening to it <laughs> while Nick and Gary were All recording right, it. No. Well, I wanted <laughs> to hear it because I, it was funny. You brought up in that podca podcast, you know, I started listening to you a year ago and I was thinking, oh, sweet summer child. I've been listening to Nerd Roddick for like five <laughs> <Yeah>. years now. <laughs> and let me tell you, the stuff that he was saying back in 2019 yeah. was he didn't realize it at the time. I didn't realize it at the time either, but he was predicting with, without any of us knowing it, that, that they were going to go down this route where they were going to self implode and self destruct. Yeah. And it was because they had an agenda to push and it was an agenda that none of us fully appreciated probably. And he, he brought this up probably until the second and third of the sequel star Wars movies yeah. episode, episode um, uh, eight and nine. Yeah. The last two that came out. And then he realized, oh, this isn't bad writing like it was the last two seasons of Game of Thrones. There's something nefarious going on here where they're insulting their fan base. And he also brought up that, you know, this also in some way started with the um, Ghostbusters remake all yeah. the way back in 2016, where they attacked the fan base who criticized how garbage the movie was. It wasn't sufficient that that 
it was just garbage writing yeah. because it was, it was certainly garbage writing, but it wasn't enough to just give us garbage writing. They had to put an ideological agenda in there and say, you're a bad person if you don't enjoy the movie. And eventually fast forward, what, eight years later yeah. and the fan base has decided, okay, so you don't know how to make good content and you don't yeah. know how to not be explicitly political. And for some reason, the message that you're always saying is straight white men are the root of all evil in the world. <laughs> well, okay, then why should I watch this? Yeah. And they've walked away. Gary's brought up that like Hollywood doesn't have just a bad writing problem. Now they have a butts in seats problem where people don't show up and watch the content. He brought up, for example, that I think it was in 2019. It was something like there were like nine films that made a billion dollars in 2019 since then in the five years since then there's been six. Yeah. Like, that and is, they're spending more and more mm -hmm. on the movie. And they're there's more, more to make them. And there's more and more um, blockbuster bombs, mm -hmm. right? There's there's more bombs that are coming out of Hollywood, and there's more um, movies and TV shows that are being panned by audiences, despite the fact that the critics love it. And we're going to get to that later today. The experts yeah. say this yeah. is great. Oh, right? the experts, yeah. But um, <laughs> no, like people are walking away from it. And what that's done is, is that it's it's wiped away the veneer of invulnerability that Hollywood used to have. People for a long time had, the, again, that had this idea that Hollywood was entertainment yeah. and that they were one and the same. And that is starting to disintegrate. You are seeing a decentralization of the arts and entertainment. And if you're on the right, this is incredible because it means that the gatekeepers, and I told you this on our like seven hour drive yeah. through like Eastern Tennessee and Southwest Virginia yesterday when we were coming back from the Homesteaders Conference. What this means is that the gatekeepers are no longer gatekeeping. The reason that we have completely lost the culture is because we don't control Hollywood. The leftists do. The cultural Marxists do. And they have gatekeeped anybody with the even remotely center-right position or a libertarian position or even just a non-leftist position yeah. out of being able to make content. But because it's fracturing and decentralizing, the gatekeepers don't have a monopoly over the creation of culturally shaping content, yeah. which means anybody with an iPhone— and that has AI software, you're going to get to a point one day where a 15-year-old in his parents' house in high school will be able to make a, a feature-length movie using his laptop. Yeah, especially, especially when you look at some of like the animation component. Uh, we, we were talking about this before. I said I, I, it's fascinating to me how, uh, how popular anime has become. And I never really – I was never into anime when I was like a kid or anything like that. It wasn't as big a deal. Um, but I, I remember watching an episode of something with, with my kids at one point and it, it, like the, you don't have the same woke crap in there. Like it, it'll either be funny or it'll be serious. Or it'll be like an actual, you know, character arc or whatever it is, but they don't, they don't, they're not constantly trying to infuse this woke, you know, when, when, when one ninja is fighting the other ninja, they don't sit there and stop and discuss their pronouns before they continue to fight. Like that does not happen in anime, right? We need they to do. examine our toxic masculinity yeah. before we engage. <laughs> like, I, you know, I, I, I once tweeted something about this and I was like, the reason that so many people in their twenties and thirties and teens are, are abandoning Hollywood and watching things like Japanese media or Korean media for yeah. that matter. You've brought this up too. Yeah. It's because like Hollywood is dead, but Tokyo is alive. Like yeah. they can still make good content out of Japan. And eventually, because we live in a digital age where you can watch stuff that's produced on the other side of the world, people are walking away and they're going towards what's good. The marketplace yeah. is solving this problem. Yeah. The gatekeepers are losing their monopoly on creating culturally shaping content. And we on the right now have the opportunity, especially with the advent of things like AI and more automation and, and more creative sh uh, shaping tools like soft, uh, you know, software that can actually produce some of the visually, you know, stunning components that yeah. used to require a hundred million dollar budget in order to make like what's going to happen is, and I like geek out about this because I have a creative streak of my own where, you know, I come up with stories all the time in my head, but for the longest time growing up, and I'm sure there's many other people that agree with this or can relate to this for the longest time you had an idea in your head, but unless you were going into film or writing, you were probably never going to have that story flesh out. Yeah, because it required a tremendous amount of time, energy and money in order to take oh. something that was an idea in your head and turn it into reality. But now think about how much time and money is going to be saved from your ability to 
either automate or cheaply produce something that, again, used to require hundreds of millions of dollars to produce. What this is going to result in is a cultural renaissance where anybody with a good idea in their head could write a novel. Anybody with a good idea in their head can make a TV show or anybody with a good idea in their he- in their head can make a movie. And what this is going to do is if, if, even outside of politics, what this is going to do is it's going to result in a cultural renaissance because you're going to see a, a explosion of novels and films and TV shows and and YouTube videos and podcasts and just anything that that will catch your eye, you're going to see an explosion of this, and and the vast majority of it is not going to be coming out of Southern California. Oh, I, I think when you say an explosion of this, I think it's great because w- one of the things you're going to see with a lot of people developing this is obviously when you have a massive studio and you have all this this technical expertise, there's a lot of things that you can do that you can't replicate on your laptop. But what it's done with a lot of these movies is they've completely given up on good dialogue and they just add more explosions. They add more special effects. They, they add more, you know, and, and we're just kind of done with it. We want a good story. We want characters you can actually relate to. And that is something that you can do with relatively little money and, and, and not the greatest of technology. You don't need state of the art to be able to create that. And I'm here for it, man. I think there's going to be so many people that say, I've got an idea. And right now, Hollywood is full of leftist gatekeepers who are responsible for keeping gates that people increasingly don't want to go through. Like, I don't care about your gate, man. And, and they're going to go through and they're, gonna, they're not going to try to go through them. They're going to go around them. And they're going to go straight to the people. And guess what? Hollywood's alienated at least... 50% of the customer base and they are begging for something. And guess what? They are willing to give the new guy a shot with something that is authentic and something that actually speaks to the issues that they're, they're seeing right now and that they're frustrated about. And man, I'm, I'm, I'm here for it. So the big takeaway from this first one with arts and entertainment is they showed us, they showed us how to beat them by quite frankly, just dropping the ball by failing on what their their original mission was, which was to provide people with relatable um, entertainment that we could enjoy and that we could learn from and that we could just kind of escape from reality at times and, and get that. And look, this is great because it's going to give other people an opportunity using this new technology. And when, when Hollywood writers want to go on strike, let them, let them. I, I love watching these people, um, you know, talk about going on, going on strike. It's like, Oh, we're not getting paid enough. And I'm looking at some of the stuff they write. I'm like, dude, if you got paid anything for this, we all got ripped off and you should be grateful you have a job. <laughs> all right. Um, let, we're going to go to our next one here. Um, but again, one, one of the, the, the first, the first greatest takeaway from this is how easy it's going to be for other people to again, come in and compete. Here's the other great takeaway and what this shows, right? Um, if you want to create good content, it's out there for everybody, but you know what you're going to need? Red meat. You're going to need red meat, right? You're going to need to prepare yourself with good American raised protein, right? That's what you're going to need because you're going to sit down and you're going to, you're going to like bang out a couple scripts, right? You need, you need that brain energy and that's going to come from American raised beef, poultry, pork, wild caught seafood, and good ranchers is here to make sure that you've got everything you need for those long nights, writing that script, creating that movie, right? So you're going to go to goodranchers.com, right? You're going to go you can use promo code Nick, and not only are you going to sign up for a subscription for some of the best beef, pork, poultry, wild caught seafood you've ever had, it's going to be delivered straight to your door. But if you sign up now, you're actually going to get a pound, no, two pounds, two pounds of jumbo wings with every single order. And and look, a, a study that was recently conducted by me just now says that eating jumbo wings from Good Ranchers will actually make you more creative. Look. I don't make that stuff up, right? It is what it is, right? It's the science. So goodranchers.com, promo code Nick, sign up for one of those subscriptions, get those free wings with the order. You're going to love it. Nick, I hate to take a step, step back, but I really want to make this point because yesterday in our conversation about this episode, we were talking about, while people are not going to movie theaters as often or aren't subscribing to Netflix as often, there is the opportunity to help use our funds in a different way as well so that when we subscribe to creators notes um some stack or community or something like that we're choosing to take our funds that would have gone to hollywood or the leftist entertainment system and we're able to direct those funds in the way we would want to direct them to the people that we support even in our conversation with justin rhodes yesterday when we were on his podcast 
he was talking about how people would join Abundance Plus that may not even be home centers, but supported what they were doing. And so not only do we have the opportunity as creators to provide entertainment that serves the viewer and what they would want specifically and form that relationship, but the viewers of that content have the ability to be intentional with where their funds go. And so that's a really neat thing, the relationship that the viewer now has with the person that's providing the entertainment that I guess you could say provides a democratization of content as well that I think is really neat and is also going to provide independent creators the ability to do things that Hollywood may never have not been able to. And you have projects like the Total Twins and Total Twins TV and Angel Studios, which are all really encouraging projects. And so I think we have a unique opportunity to take back the attention that Hollywood once did and put it towards things that are actually going to make our community stronger. No, I, th I think it's an excellent point because it is. It's one of those areas where it, it's not simply a question of creators now having different opportunities. Consumers now have a, a lot more opportunities, which means everybody gets to participate in the the, the reconquista of, of the arts and entertainment world. And it doesn't mean necessarily taking over Hollywood. Again, it means going around them and creating something new and different and not creating something that's so easy to centralize and take over in the future. And, and again, I'm, I'm here for it. Nick, I, I loved your analogy about how they've built a wall and have been gatekeeping behind it for generations. And we are starting to realize that not only is the wall crumbling, but there's holes in the wall and we're just going around it. So yeah. when it comes to this institution, it's not that we're going to take back Hollywood. Nobody on the right thinks we're taking back <laughs> Hollywood. It's that Hollywood is making themselves irrelevant. And now we have seen... Through the emergence of things like AI or cheaper video software or the abil the increasing ability for you to make content, either like write a novel again or make a, a movie or a TV show or outside of, of Southern California, that is going to make, in addition to other places too, like you brought up anime in Japan, for example, there's other avenues to create fantastic culturally shaping content around Hollywood. So you don't have to storm the castle yep. and take it. You can go around it. And the reason that I bring this up again is because this is the exact same phenomenon that is starting to play out, but it's it's we're not further along the road yet when it comes to the next of these institutions. Oh, yeah. This is one of my favorites to go after. And quite frankly, kind of at the root at a, at a lot of everything else, because a lot of things start here and then trickle other places, right? And that's academia, and um, and by academia, we're going to talk about higher ed, but it's also it's also the influence that it's had within even our, our public school system. Um, so it's not just higher ed. Right. A lot of these ideas have escaped out of the sociology department of Berkeley and made them what made them their way into elementary school. And so this is a um, and, and, and I, I want to key this off by asking kind of the audience a question and, and something to think about. Right. When you hear the term the experts say for the longest time that used to be something where when we were when we were told or when we were told that hey what i'm going to tell you next has been agreed upon by experts there was a certain degree of relevance that came with that statement because the expectation was is that if you're an expert what that probably means is that you have a a lifetime of relevant education research experience all leading us to the conclusion that Whatever you say on this topic has a great degree of validity that we can trust the analysis that you're doing, not necessarily to be perfect because after all things change over time, but reasonably certain that whatever you're going to say was not going to be some off the wall crackpot, you know, garbage. When you hear the experts say now, do you feel that way? I, I don't. You know what I hear? When I hear them say the experts say, I immediately sub substitute it with leftists lie or leftists <laughs> would like us to believe yeah. that whatever because quite frankly just like hollywood there's been a lot of gatekeeping within academia and this is absolutely one of the institutions that gramsci and dushke's long march has, yeah. has overtaken over the last 50 60 years but here's the thing as somebody who has a higher degree mm. um i can tell you there's plenty of avenues out there for you to learn stuff, especially in the humanities, hard sciences are different. There's, there's, yeah. I think there will always be a need for higher education, the university system when it comes to things like physics or engineering or biology, but, or, or medicine, for example. But 
I think that when it comes to the arts and humanities, there's way more opportunities now than there were even 15, 20 years ago when it comes to learning stuff. For example, like I have a degree in political science and history, and then I have a master's in history. I have probably learned more from the internet, from YouTube, from pulling up on like Internet Archive, a book that was written 200 years ago that I don't want to order and spend $200 <laughs> being shipped to me, yeah. um, but I still want to read it. I've probably learned more from the internet than I did from any college classes when it comes to the fields that I got a degree in. I, I think in, in some ways my degrees are actually pretty worthless. Now, then people might say, well, then why'd you go get a master's, Christian? Uh, because I just wanted it for myself. And my dad <laughs> really, really pushed me to do it because, you know, he has a PhD and my grandfather had a PhD. And so there was like an expectation that I'd go out there and do it. But let me tell you, as somebody who has a master's degree, when I hear somebody say, well, I have a master's in something and this means I'm smarter than you. I, I know what I'm talking about. And you, you see these like voices on places like X all the time where it's like left wing people, you know, use their credentialing in order to argue I'm smart and you're an idiot and you should listen to me. Why? Because I have a fancy piece of paper that I pay $200,000 for. That does not tell me anything. And, and there used to be a point in time when – saying I have a degree or I have a degree actually meant something. There used to be a point in time where these universities and institutions actually had a degree of prestige that was warranted. We do not live in that time anymore. Let me tell you, like Harvard, in some people's eyes, it wasn't that long ago that Harvard, rightfully so, was yeah. considered a prestigious institution that if you got a degree from there, it meant something. I, I look at Harvard today, and if you get a degree of, you know, in any of these social sciences or humanities from Harvard, man, let me tell you, that means nothing to me. I think it's it's interesting. Uh, ben Shapiro said something similar to this, but Thomas Sowell made a statement that one of the one of the chief advantages of having a degree from Harvard is you no longer have to be impressed by a degree from Harvard. <laughs> and I, I think here, here's what I want people to understand. When we were talking about arts and entertainment, we made we we distinguished between Hollywood and arts and entertainment. Arts and entertainment is a genre. It's a thing. It's a category. Hollywood is, is a particular place or institution or approach to delivering things within that category. It's the same thing when we talk about academia or higher education and the current American university system. I have no problem with higher education. I have no problem with the category of academia. I have no problem with people coming together and sharing thoughts and ideas and perspectives and conducting research. But the expectation used to be that that research was going to be rigorous in its nature. It was going to be as comprehensive as possible. It was going to be open to inquiry and it was going to be open to discussion and it was going to be open to disagreement. And then they were all going to follow certain categories with respect to the scientific method, with respect to logic and, and uh, reason and data analysis. And I think what the left identified, and this is something they do with a lot of things, right? The, the word expert, why does the word expert have value? Because there's certain assumptions behind it. And it goes to what I said initially. It means that there's a lifelong um, um, degree of, of research and analysis and experience. And the expectation when you hear expert is this is someone that knows so much about a particular topic that when they speak on it, they can be relied to give you good information. That's not what expert means anymore. Expert now means you're the best at regurgitating. Re <sighs> so I'm going to start that over. Expert now means you're the best at regurgitating whatever progressive trope has now come up and you can get the peer reviewed article if you do a good enough job being loyal to whatever the trope is. And if you question the trope, you, you might have your academic credentials questioned now. And we saw this in no greater episode than the grievance, uh, the grievance papers, the scandal that took place when James Lid uh, Lindsay and uh, Peter Bogosian and um, Helen Pluck, Rose. Helen Pluck Rose started writing all of these nonsense articles, but they used the right terminology. They picked the right enemy for their papers and they got them. They got them into prestigious journals past peer review. And this is the part where, again, people are starting to look at it and saying, look, I'm sorry, I don't believe you anymore. So there, there was always this core, I think, at the grassroots level that was starting to become highly skeptical of higher education, especially when somebody's coming home with their gender studies degree and then working a, as a barista. Like, what was the point of that? And then now you're actually starting to see it within hiring practices of pretty major law firms, companies, 
where it used to be a foregone conclusion or a foregone conclusion that if you came from Harvard or from Yale or from the Ivy League, well, then, of course, you were the cream of the crop. And now you're starting to see these, again, these law firms and these other institutions starting to open up the number of universities they will accept degrees from because what they want are, are competent technicians, competent managers. They don't want activists. And that's what a lot of these institutions of higher education are producing. They're not producing people that can actually deliver expertise in a way that we traditionally associated with it. They're people that are really good at regurgitating the trope. And that's, it turns out that is economically useless. And here's the other thing I want to add, and this is really important to remember. We are living in a time where access to information, to genuine expertise, has never been more abundant or f freer, more affordable than it currently is right now through the internet. And yet, Higher education is more expensive than ever before. Why? Because increasingly what you're paying for at higher education is the credential, not the education. And then the other thing that we need to recognize about all this, when you look at the amount of money, they're raising your tuition to give you a BS degree, which you will not be able to get a, a job good enough to pay back the loan for that degree so they can pay somebody on the DEI staff half a million dollars a year. It has essentially become a marketplace to provide jobs for people that would not be economically viable in any sane society. And then how have they shown us how to beat them? Well, it's easy. One, the credential might be really important for certain jobs. And, and keep in mind, this is going to get us into another conversation later on in this discussion where we talk about the federal bureaucracy and this kind of unholy alliance between the bureaucracy and higher ed. And I'm going to reveal what exactly what that looks like because it's bad. But it, there's this idea that there's certain credentials that you need from the university in order to, to even be able to consider the occupation. You want to be a lawyer? Got to go to law school. Got to pass the bar. You want to be a doctor? Got to get your medical certifications. You got to go through higher ed. Right, so we can't, they've created all these legal barriers, and here's what's going to happen. As more and more people realize, and as more and more people within the private sector understand that what I want is capability, not a credential from an institution that, quite frankly, has lost its way, you're going to watch higher ed pony up to the table with the bureaucracy and with politicians and beg for more money and bang for more licensure requirements to prevent you from being able to provide products, services, unless you go to them first. And again, the beautiful part about this is that to the extent that we still can, because there's, there's a ton of industries where you don't need higher ed at all. That doesn't mean you don't need a higher level of education. You just don't need academia. You don't need their little certification. Because at the end, what a business is interested in, or if you're an entrepreneur, even better, what your customers are interested in is, can you deliver? Can you deliver on the goods and services you have promised? And if the answer is yes, then I don't care about your credential. And if the answer is no, I don't care about the credential. <laughs> like either way. And so I, I think this is, this is really positive because we're not only seeing this in higher ed where people are just skipping it. And, and we can tell you right here, as, as, we, as we look at people to bring on to, you know, help us with video editing and whatnot, we really don't care if you have a degree. We care about whether or not you understand our mission and whether or not you can get the job done. If you can do those things and you have a degree, great. If you can do those things and you don't have a degree, probably even better at this point. And, and I think that's, that's incredibly powerful from an economic standpoint, from a marketplace standpoint. The other thing I would say that's really encouraging to me is that so many of these crazy ideas from academia have made their way into public school systems. And now you're starting to see more and more people either pull their kids from school and homeschool or they're going into co-ops. You see people like Matt Boudreaux and Tim Kennedy offering you know, um, uh, other educational opportunities. People are breaking away from this mold that they have had forced down their throats for years that this is the way education is done. And as technology has advanced, as other opportunities have presented, presented themselves, more and more parents, more and more students, more and more people are saying, yeah, I just, again, you're guarding a gate I don't care to go through. Um, so I, I think this is, so again, how do we fight back about this? Um, and, and keep in mind, the, the, there's, there's a, a few ways that, again, academia and higher ed in the United States have, have kind of revealed 
the game. We've known for a while that they've been totally co-opted by the left, but we always kind of thought like, okay, those are some crazy ideas in college, but people get out, they get a job, they get a family, it becomes better. Uh, what they're now realizing is that higher ed has been taking more and more of their tax dollars, not asking for them, taking them. Then they go to the federal government, they say, and we want you to give taxpayer backed federal loans. And then those students come to the university, get a degree that's worthless, not all of them, right? But a lot of degrees out there are absolutely economically worthless. And then they can't pay back the loans. Well, after higher ed has already got their money, they got the money they took from you. Then they got the money that was loaned to them by the federal government. Then those same higher, those institutions of higher education are going back to Congress and saying, you should forgive those loans, which means they want to take more money from you because it's going to be the taxpayers that actually have to, to pay off those loans. So they're doing all this. They have their, their uh, prestige within the general population has never been lower. The value of what they provide never been lower. Can, 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 and, can the, you, uh, and the alternatives to what they provide never been more abundant. Could you elaborate on the, how the prestige has never been lower? Because I think a lot of people on the right kind of habitually know to some degree how, oh yeah, the university system has lost their credibility. But I don't think that, that a lot of people kind of appreciate just how rapid it, it, it's collapsed in just a, a couple of years, honestly, because I remember it was probably 10 years ago that even most Republicans would have said, oh yeah, yeah, yeah the university system might have problems, but it's still very valuable. Today, the animosity that's directed towards the university system is is at an all-time high. And well, I, I think it's totally reasonable when you consider things like how the the ideas that used to be stuck within the sociology department at Berkeley, like you were bringing up, are no longer stuck within the sociology department at Berkeley. They're now man being manifested in the real world. Yeah, well, that's in your kid's daycare. And, and then I, I think, so there's a couple of things. One, I think over time people have realized that it was crazy, but now it's affecting them in a way that has never affected them before. It's more expensive. So now I, I not only do I have to pay for the privilege of having my child indoctrinated, but then you're going to take my money without even me paying for, without even me offering it to you for the privilege of indoctrinating my child. Then the ideas from that university are now going to indoctrinate my child in, in elementary school and middle school and in high school. And then on top of that, when, when you come to me and you say, oh, well, that's just, that's crazy. That's extreme. We're the experts. Then I, I watch one study after another coming out of prestigious universities, universities, backing up the idea that we should be giving puberty blockers to 11 year olds, that, that it's actually moral and good to, to be able to give sex change operations to minors, to people under the age of 18. And there's a certain point where rational human beings look at that and they say, this is wrong. And then inevitably some leftist shows up on Twitter and goes, Oh, I didn't know you were an expert on this. Like, you know what? I'm, I'm not an expert on human biology, but you know what? I'm also not a moron. I'm not an idiot. I know that when you give the puberty blockers to an 11 year old, that's going to have a far greater effect than you're telling me it will. I know that when you have a minor, when a 16 year old goes through a sex change operation, that is bad for them mentally and physically. And they're probably going to be dealing with that for the rest of their life because that's not reversible. I know that. And I don't need 20 different studies. I don't need a bunch of peer reviewed studies to tell me that because again, I'm not a moron. And that is, that is huge. And then you, all, you will inevitably also have big events like October 7th. If you would have, when you look at the testimony before Congress, when, when President Gay gets up there from, from Harvard and they ask a question of like, hey, is, is, is you know, <laughs> preaching genocide against Jews against your, your policy? And they can't give a direct answer to the question. Everybody watching that knows if the question had been, hey, if you're advocating genocide against trans people, would that be against your university policy? The, state, the, the word would have been in, in like resounding, oh, absolutely, of course, yes, it is. In fact, we, we go to all these measures to make sure, we, good, good, because you shouldn't be you know, preaching genocide toward anybody for any reason. But when it came to this category, she, oh, she wanted to equivocate. The president at, at, at Penn State wanted to equivocate. And what happened? Well, now you have major donors like Bill Ackman saying, I'm not donating to this university anymore. And what did the left respond? What did, what did higher education, what did academia, the, the, the people that are supposed to know the most about debate and critical thought and point and counterpoint, what did they come back with? Oh, well, you're, you're a racist and you're a sexist. 
because the president of Harvard is a black woman. And that's the only possible explanation for why you could be mad at the fact that there are raging anti-Semites that are cheering on Hamas, rolling around Harvard, intimidating Jewish students. That's the only reason you could possibly be upset with that is because you're racist and sexist. And then what happens? Oh, it turns out that President Gay had, gosh, plagiarized a lot of information to get her own degree. Gee, is that is that in keeping with the best standards of Harvard? Golly gee willikers, no, it isn't. And then once again, what was the response to that? No, 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 no. It's not that you're upset about blatant plagiarizing. You're just racist and sexist. And this is the part where people, even on the left, who are major donors, look at that and say, mm, yeah, no. Not only am I not going to donate now, you, you want to fight? Let's have a fight. And this is the part where, uh, again, from the donor perspective, they're seeing what's going on and they're telling academia no. I can tell you that more and more people in elected office are really starting to question these huge budget items for higher ed. I, I sat there. I used to be the chair of the subcommittee on higher education in the Virginia House of Delegates. And I and look, I, I got along with a lot of the people that came and advocated, some very, very nice people. But I did like asking the question, if you can't convince my constituents to voluntarily pay you to educate them, why do you think you can come to me and get me to take it from them in order to give it to you? If you can't convince them, do you think I'm going to coerce them? Yeah, that ain't, that ain't happening. I'm not voting for that. And so you got more and more people standing up and saying, no, you don't get to tell me that stealing hundreds of millions of dollars in state budgets or hundreds of billions between state and federal budgets and then just giving it to higher education so my kid can come home on Thanksgiving and tell me what a, a racist, patriarchal colonizer I am. You don't get to tell me that that's an, that's an inherent good and I just need to fork over more money to you. And then finally, when it comes to the basic consumer of education, more and more of them are actually looking for different universities or they're skipping the university process altogether. Not because they don't want a higher degree of education, but because they don't think they're going to get it at that university. And they're certainly not going to get it for an affordable price point. And so once again, higher education is more expensive and more gatekeeping at a time where information and, and access to education is more abundant and cheaper than ever. And people have realized, you know what? I don't need to fight for your institution. I can go around it. I can go around it. They have destroyed their own credibility. Yes. There, there used to be a degree of legitimacy that came with higher education and academia, and they have burned it to the ground. And the, the last thing that I'll, I'll say on this to link it to our previous topic about the arts and, and entertainment is that just like the arts and entertainment, there was this idea that the left are intelligent, creative people. They're not. They're, Marxists cannot produce anything beautiful. And they cannot produce anything that is intellectually challenging. They can only burn things to the ground. And so it's ironic that as we've seen the long march through the institutions come to its its apex at the same time that they have, and I mean universally capture control over it. I, I mean, Thomas Sowell brings this up. How many Republicans are in the sociology department at your nearest <laughs> university? Yeah. Uh, probably zero. Yeah. Right. Like there's been so many charts that people have probably seen that show like the the ideological um, percentage of people by department within most universities. In Harvard, for example, it's something like 85 percent identify as liberal, not moderate, liberal or very liberal. Yeah. And it's something like one or two percent identify as conservative. Yeah. And so what's happened is, is that they've completed the march of the institutions like, oh, like yeah. they total, have complete, total capture, total, total ideological, ideological capture. capture. And is it any surprise that at the same time that they have completed the march, there's no more marching to be had because they have universal control over it. At the same time that they've completed that march, they're now starting to watch as the the luster and and prestige and legitimacy behind these institutions are being washed away. Mm -hmm. They're they're imploding, just like the arts and entertainment, just like Hollywood. They are imploding. They're losing credibility, and we are responding accordingly. We are walking away from it. People are now realizing that, you know what? You don't need to go to a high pricey university where you learn about, you know, queer theory and you're taught that decolonization equals shooting a bunch of Jewish people and a bunch of, you know, foreigners at a music festival on October 7th and that the scientific method is a form of white supremacy. You don't need to be spending $200,000 to get a degree where you're taught those three things. Mm -hmm. You can actually learn a lot of stuff for free or at a heavy discount from before, from just the internet. Yeah. And so I think that you're seeing an explosion of 
new opportunities. You're seeing a decentralization of the education system. And it's not just higher ed. It's also within the public school. This is why on the right, you're seeing an increasing push towards homeschooling and private schooling rather than going through the government only option, because we realize the government only option is actually part of the reason that we're in this mess to begin with, Mm -hmm. because you are sending your children to be educated by people who hate you. Maybe we should stop doing that. And increasingly we are. And so I think that the answer to the left's ideological capture over academia is in some ways the same exact answer as the left's ideological capture over arts and entertainment. It's stop patronizing the institutions that have been captured by your ideological mortal enemies who despise you. Stop giving Marxists your money and your time and lending them a degree of credibility and prestige that they do not deserve. Yeah. Hamilton. There, there, there's a few reasons here why universities have been able to operate outside the bounds of reality and tell people that if you come to our university, you will be prepared for, to work within an industry and make a good living. There's a couple of reasons for that. One, it is parents who continue, continue to tell your, their children that a college degree is a requirement to make a good living and live a good life. Two, and probably the most pervasive, is that at every university there is a loan officer ready to meet the new student who just came to tour the university, who's telling them how easy it is to borrow money to get that education. Mm-hmm. And three, it's the university themselves that is allowing students to believe that if they come and like Christian said, patron the university, that they will be better off for it. But I want to go to two things real quick. And I want people to imagine how disappointing it is for someone to go through four years of college, graduate and not be able to find a job and realize that what they were told to be true, that is, if you go to college, get a degree, make a grade, you can get a job is not true. Yeah. And the second thing is, If we are going to go around higher education, then how important is it in our conversations with people to illustrate our own opinion, tell people our own opinion that college may not be the right answer? Because so much of college being the next step after high school is being pushed by parents who in their friend groups are talking about, oh, my student's going to, you know, my kid's going to go to this university or that university. And if there are just a few of us that will jump in and say, hey, you know what, I don't think college, you know, has to be the right choice for my kid. How much progress can we make in helping people realize that there is another route? Yeah. Last thing here is that the Peterson Academy hasn't been launched yet. I believe Michaela Peterson just posted on social media yesterday that in the next two to three months, Peterson Academy should be live and running. I'm really excited to see what they're able to do in terms of higher education because of how well aligned they ha- will make their courses to the needs of an industry and employers. And I think the future of online education is very exciting. And just like content creators and YouTube being the roundabout means of entertainment around Hollywood, we could see a lot of these online universities such as Peterson Academy pop up and provide that solution. No, I, I think that's true. I, I think also um, one of the things that the higher ed has managed to do in order to protect themselves is you, you ask like, who, where do the people with these like weird sociology degrees go? HR departments. They go into HR departments within industries and then they gatekeep from within those, those industries. And they look for people that are like-minded before they look for people with the appropriate skill sets. All right. Like, you, I'm sorry. You can't tell me that doesn't, I'm not saying it happens with all of them, but you can't tell me that doesn't happen. And, and you again, know what they do is they, they, they create an entire concept. It's, it's almost like, yeah. like they create a myth or a religion of their own, mm-hmm. right? DEI or anti-racism. And then they mandate yeah. that corporate America adopt this in the form of paid positions in whole departments. How many people had heard of the phrase DEI 10 years ago? Or ESG. And now it's almost like every corporation in America needs to have a DEI officer mm-hmm. or an ESG compliance yeah. team. Or, el- or else you'll get sued by one of these groups that works in coordination with higher ed, with politicians. I- again, there, there, is, there is a lot of networking that goes on between these groups. Like I, I have seen it firsthand. There's a lot of networking that goes on between these groups in order to justify their own paid positions. Because these positions would never exist in just a free market. They can only exist when the process is manipulated, largely by government, right, which comes in and then supports this. And so, again, more and more, here's what I would ask. From, from, as a parent, and I felt this, right, when my, when my 
uh, oldest daughter was graduating. My son's graduating this year from high school. There's almost, oh, what, what college are they going to? And, and it's like, oh, well, they, they chose to do this. And there's almost like, and I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm, I think that's wonderful. They chose to do something that's, that's economically productive. I know because they're economically productive. It's like my 21 year old just bought a house. Like nobody gets to lecture me. Like, I'm, I'm sorry, but the barista with a master's in gender studies doesn't get to look down on my daughter who's buying her first house, right? With, with her fiance as she's, as she's got a steady income and making a lot more than that barista. Not to mention the fact that she actually has a, a career that, that sets her up for entrepreneurship, that puts her in a great position to be able to work if she wants to, while at the same time raising children. Like she picked something that was economically perfect for her and her future goals as a family. And you know what? I couldn't be more proud of her for it. And she worked her butt off. To, she didn't take out a loan. She didn't, she didn't come to us. She worked the night shift at McDonald's. She pet sit. She house sit. She did all of it. Paid off everything. And then, and she's already made more working right than what it costs for her to get that credential to be able to do it and so parents I think we need to do a better job of telling our kids like look there are certain occupations which I will even go so far as to say unfortunately you have to go to higher ed in order to get the proper credential to be able to legally be permitted to do it there are there are other professions for which you're going to need a great deal of education because it's important it's highly technical it's highly skilled you need to learn from other craftsmen you need to learn from other experts within a particular field all of that's good and you should be proud when your child chooses to to pick that particular career but do not fall into the trap of wanting to feel just as cool as the other parent by by automatically saying my kids going to this school or they're going to this university or whatnot if your kids an entrepreneur if your kids a skilled technician chances are they're going to actually put themselves in a, in a wonderful position, both economically and for future advancement if they want to pursue an entrepreneurial route. And so part of that is on parents. Part of it is also on properly educating students on all of the different options available to them. And, and, and also, I, I really think this, this part is important. Understanding that whatever that credential might be at that university, right? your alma mater is not what it was when you went there as a kid. And you need to understand that. And if you're still just blindly supporting them and blindly giving them millions of dollars, right, or just blindly fighting to send your kid there, you're taking out a second mortgage so your kid can go to the same university that you went to or the one you looked up at, and you're not properly understanding what has actually changed about that university, well, then don't be surprised when not only does your kid come out with a degree that is not economically viable, but also comes out hating you. Can you imagine like the sense of betrayal, not only on behalf of the student that feels like, you know, I did all this work, I did what I was told to do, and then it's not, now it's not working, but also the betrayal that the parent feels where it's like, we took out a second mortgage, we sacrificed, we went without to be able to do this, and now we're the bad guys, now we're evil, because your college professor said so? And this is the part where, again, let's just be aware of the circumstances, we are not denigrating higher education. We are not denigrating universities which, which work very, very hard to have an intellectually rigorous curriculum that properly prepares students to be able to be economically viable. We're, we're, not, we're not denigrating any of that. We are denigrating the complete ideological capture that has taken place in so much of academia in the West, specifically within the United States. And we are telling people, whether you're a student, whether you're a parent, or whether you're an employer, stop just arbitrarily giving these institutions power because of a reputation that they built decades ago and have spent the last several years doing their, their best to absolutely crush and kill it. You know, there was a point in time when my dream for as long as I can remember since I was like literally like five or six, my dream was to get a degree, get a PhD, and then go into a university and teach history. Yeah. That's what I wanted to do. And then I met you. Thanks for derailing it. But um, no, no. <laughs> you talked me into running for office, and I didn't want to do that. So. We, we're, de we're we even. derailed both of our we're life even. plans. <laughs> but you know what's interesting is that that was my dream for my my whole childhood from when I was like literally six years old. I know many six-year-olds are not thinking about, I want to be a college professor and teach history. I, I, I did. <laughs> it, I, you could you could ask my, my parents. Yeah. They, they, would, they would say I'm not lying. I believe you. But that was my dream from when I was like six to about when I was like 18 around the time that I went off to college and decided to do a career shift and, and work with you in politics. Right. But you know what? 
if I had to pick today, like, have I gone down the right path or should I have gone down that path that I originally dreamed of? I would say that I think I did go down the right path because here's the, here's the beautiful thing. And this actually tees up the next institution. The beautiful thing is, is that I can still teach history mm -hmm. through YouTube. I don't need to go get the credential, get the PhD, and then work a dead end job making 35,000, 40,000 a year as an associate professor at some university somewhere and kowtow to the cultural Marxists that have hijacked the university and not be open and honest about what I believe in with people. I can make YouTube videos talking about history and still giving the type of lectures and analysis and insight into things that I'm super passionate about because what people who, who, Maybe not, you know, people who don't know me super well might not know that, like, I care more about history than I do politics. Yeah. And, and you know that, Nick. And the other thing is, is that we're already doing this. Like, consider how many views we've got from, like, just the Y Minutes. And I do a lot of the script writing there. I mean, we've done videos where we've talked about very in-depth historical topics. Now, we're only doing them in, like, three to five minutes. But, like, we're also working on other channels that will launch at some point, probably later this year where I'm going to be able to do the exact same type of stuff that I originally was dreaming of doing in a university classroom as a lecturer with a PhD. I don't have to go down that route now. If I'm passionate about a topic and I want to, I want to teach it to other people, I just need to make a YouTube channel and start pumping out videos and I can do exactly what I was originally dreaming of doing as a college professor without having to go through, again, the leftist gatekeepers that have hijacked the institution. So what does this have in common with the next inst well, institution? Well, wait a second. I, I want to say okay. some of this first. Um, this, this is important because we're, we're not saying people have to give up on their dreams of what they wanted to be. We're saying that the institutions that used to be necessary in order to, to live out those dreams are no longer anywhere near as necessary as they used to be. And in fact, they could be a positive impediment to you being able to do it. So, so like really understand and embrace the freedom that exists out there in these other opportunities and look at those. Let's go on to our next thing. We got, we got four more that we're going to go through. So we're going to go through some of these a little bit faster than the first two. We kind of intentionally picked those two up front because there was a lot of stuff to unpack. These other ones, important, but we're going to go a little bit faster. So the media... Right. The, <laughs> you know what our outline says? I want to just tell the audience because they're going to laugh. The outline that, that, that we built when we were driving yesterday for the media is the first point is just LOL. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We were looking at that and we're like, out of all the institutions that have just done their, their level best to, to discredit themselves, the media is really high on this and they've been doing it for decades now. Um, we, we've all kind of recognized, I remember my grandfather watching Walter Cronkite and when he would come on, he called him, oh, the head red. Well, I don't remember this. My dad does, but he told me the story. Um, when Walter Cronkite would come on, my grandpa would be like, oh, the head red's on. And, and but you didn't have any other options, right? And when, when Fox News... Uh, you know, came on the scene, they just blew up overnight because 50% of the, the customer base had been completely alienated by CNN. And then you saw other left-wing channels trying to like, you know, dominate and compete on cable news networks. And then they regularly get crushed by Fox news on, on, on cable news networks. Um, but then you, you also look at the traditional legacy media, NBC, ABC, like they're, they're, they still have some power, but it's been significantly reduced and, and I think a part of this, this, this goes back, we, we mentioned how the left kind of absconded with the word expert. They wanted to use the word expert while changing the fundamental meaning. The same thing has happened with journalists. The same thing has happened with objective journalists. You want to be an editorialist, fine. Give me your opinion all day long. Our problem is not with the opinion piece articles. Our problem is with the people that get up there and advertise, the, advertise themselves as objective journalists whose only job is to share with you the truth. And it becomes obvious and apparent both by what they tell you and by what they don't that they actually have an agenda. And they, they put forward this agenda. And when they get called on it, what do they say? Well, this isn't about left or right. This is just about right or wrong. Oh, how convenient. You get to decide what right and wrong is. You get to decide what the acceptable opinion is. You get to decide what the good people think about this. And clearly, if you disagree with your analysis, it must mean that you're a bad person. And people have gotten sick of it. They've gotten tired of it. Not to mention the fact that how often the media is wrong. <laughs> And I think two things in particular have just really destroyed the media as of late. One was their coverage of COVID. 
watching media just completely try to engage in overt character assassination for anybody that didn't march to the government narrative. And that's amazing because the, aren't the media supposed to be the watchdogs of the government? No, the media are only the watchdogs of the government if they don't like who's in power. And even then, they'll skew the message. But if they like who's in power, they will run interference all day long and essentially become another wing of the, of the government. The other thing that I think absolutely crushed a lot of trust in media and because it showed the blatant hypocrisy is when a lot of these organizations started to do fact-checking. Because when you say we're going to fact-check, right? First, you had editorialists. None of us cared. We all know what you're doing. That's opinion piece. That's fine. Opinion pieces are interesting, and they can be very, very useful, especially when you tell me it's an opinion piece. Then it was objective journalism, which ended up becoming nothing more than editorials. And we're like, okay, you've lost credibility because you told me you were doing one thing when in reality you were doing something else. But then they did fact-checking. And I remember originally it was like, oh, this is this is an interesting concept because we know that there's a lot of stuff that's put out there that's, let's just say, um, if not blatantly false, deliberately misleading. But then you started to read the fact checks and you realize that the fact checkers were engaging in deliberate misleading. And, and I, I have personal experience with this. I remember when I was running for Congress, I made a statement about my opponent's voting record. And, and then all of a sudden I got fact checked. And they came out and they said that I was, um, I think they said it was a half truth or that it was mostly false. And I was like, wait a second, how could my statement be, be false? Like we check this because it was always very important to me to be accurate in what I said. I said, we check this, like I'm not wrong here. And then I read the article and I realized that what they were fact checking was not my statement. What they were fact checking is what they thought I meant by my statement. That's not a fact check. You're now editorializing the fact check. You're not actually you're not actually giving people analysis of what I said. You're saying, well, he said this, but we really think he meant this, and that would be wrong. Well, that's not what I said, and that's not what I meant. So you're wrong, but it doesn't matter because they're the fact checkers. Okay, let me ask everyone right now. When you see something pop up on Instagram or Facebook or you know whatever it is, and you see fact checkers have said that there's missing context or fact checkers have said this, do you trust the information you're about to receive less? I don't. In fact, I want to read it even more. It's like I want to read it harder now because I am so sick of people that once again have lied to me about what their agenda is, right, attempting to manipulate me. And this is, again, this is not just bad practice. This is dangerous. Um, but it's only dangerous as long as I believe you. And nobody believes them anymore. Or, or at least... Nobody who isn't um, ideologically inclined to believe them. Now, the left will say, well, you're guilty of the same thing on the right. Fine. But what I'm, what I'm absolutely tired of, and, which, and what I don't honestly see as much on the right, is this idea of, again, people telling me their objective or telling me that all they're doing is fact-checking and then deliberately lying about what they're doing. It's just, it's just insane. When I, when I was growing up, used, my family would say that the only job that you can have where you can consistent be, consistently be wrong and still keep your job is being a weatherman on TV. <laughs> but I think we've learned that there are actually a lot more jobs where you can consistently be wrong and still keep your job. But what I find to be so funny is that my parents will actually watch a weatherman on YouTube who has a YouTube channel that's only about the weather, and he's more accurate than the weatherman on TV. Yeah. No, it, it, again, it was one thing where the, the media, just like Hollywood, used to be really gatekept. Like you, you had like three channels to watch the news. And then when cable came around, you had more options, but most of them were left wing or left leaning. And same thing with newspapers. If you, if you want to talk about an institution that is just completely dying right now, it's, it's used newspapers. And yeah, they, they've, they've switched to online, but I want to, I, I got to share this story. Because this last General Assembly session, I kept running into this issue where my colleagues were like, well, we got to do a press conference. I was like, why? And well, well, because we got to get this out. We want the press to be able to cover it. They're covering the other guys. They need to cover us. I said, yeah. But when they cover the other guys, they repeat their talking points as if they're facts. When they cover us, they, they selectively quote us and they try to make us look like idiots. Why would we, why would we want to give them the time? Why would we want to give them legitimacy by talking to them? Well, that's, you know, they're, they're, they're the big boys on the block. And I, I remember he's like, and we were even talking about, okay, well, we'll invite some of these other papers. And it was like, well, let's invite the big boys too, like the Washington Post. 
And I finally looked at him. I said, okay, guys, can I explain something real quick here? They're like, okay, go ahead. I said, the Washington Post has a daily readership. Um, I'm going to bring it up right now. Their average, their printed weekly circulation, weekly circulation for the Washington Post is 139,232 subscribers. 139,232 subscribers for the Washington Post. Now, their online is about 3.5 million. I said, now, I want, I want you to think about what this means. Does that mean that every week, every week, 3.5 million people are going to see the article that we do in this press conference? No. Does it mean that uh, 139,232 people are going to see this? No. Now, let's say they do see it. What does it mean then? Are they, are they going to hear exactly what we said in the spirit in which we said it? And, and get the true meaning of, of what we wanted to say? No, they're going to get the Washington Post's view of what we said. So now we're going to set up all this time, setting up a press conference, inviting, begging them to come, giving them legitimacy, because after all, they're hearing both sides for 139,000 subscribers. I said, guys, I took the speech that one of our colleagues gave on the floor in response to something one of our Democrat colleagues said, and I put it on my Instagram, and it has over 500,000 views in less than 24 hours. Now, is it the Washington Post's version of what we said? No, it's our version of what we said, and it's got 500,000 views. What do you think is more valuable? And they finally was like, okay, that's a good point. And then the guy who gave the speech looked at his phone. He's like, oh my gosh, I have 500 new subscribers on an Instagram page I haven't used in a year. Like this, guys, this is what I'm talking about. Once upon a time, you were absolutely right. We would have to line up a press conference, invite all these reporters here. And that was the only way we could do it. And we could just hope that they would kind of try to maybe sort of be fair with us. We don't got to do that anymore. But you got to actually put in the work of going on to these other platforms and letting people know, because guess what? There's 50% of the population at least really wants to know what we're doing, what we think. Are we making good on what we promised them we would do? And if they've got to get that information through the Washington Post, the conclusion they're going to come to is, nope, we're not. We're weak. We're stupid. We're idiots. We're liars. But if we can show them, no, this is what we did. This is how we did it. This is why we did it this way and we can go directly to them, they want to hear our side of the story. Stop letting your ideological enemies be the only ones allowed to tell it. I think what's super important about what you just said, Nick, is that in previously we could go to a press conference and deliver what we wanted to say, and all we would have to do is deliver the information, and then we could rely on someone else to distribute that information. Yeah. But now in modern day, not only do we have to think about what we are going to communicate, but we also have to be very intentional in the way that we communicate it. And I think the right in oftentimes has failed to capture that opportunity because it does require more work. It does require more intentionality. And I think we should be very weary of making an attempt to push our message on social, it not working out, and then us blaming the media platform the yeah. social platform for our lack of reach. This is a skill. This is something that we learn how to do. Our effectiveness in communication is something that grows over the repetitions that we use. And often, you know, Nick, I think you've been one of the few people that has been willing to put in the work to learn how to effectively communicate to people through the medium. And we on the right have to be very willing and very open to putting in the work to do that because it's not something where we can just pick up our phone record a video and hope that it gets 500,000 views. It is something that we must invest in over a long period of time, just like the left has. Yeah. Left has been doing this for years and we've been behind and it's time for us to get our act together. No, it's a great point. And it kind of leads us into our next, our next segment here, because when we talk about the media and we talk about how do we fight back, a lot of it has been on social media platforms. Well, where do those, where do most of those originate from? Big tech, Silicon Valley. Again, we're talking about organizations, companies, institutions that don't necessarily have our best interest in mind. And once again, we saw that on full display before COVID, but definitely during COVID and certainly um, during the, um, the presidential election in 2016 and then again in 2020. And so I, I think that and I, and I want to say this, but there's been a lot of people that would say, I, I've had people get mad at me before that I'm, I put out content on anything but Rumble or anything but Truth Social. And I like to tell people like, look, I've, I've got a Truth Social account. I've got a Rumble account. 
happy to put out stuff there. We do put out stuff there. But that's not the only place I'm going to compete for the culture. I'm going to compete for the culture on every platform I possibly can because if we're not doing it, then they're only getting one message. And, and as bad as big tech has been, I will say this. There have been some very, very important congressional hearings, which has exposed so much about how the government worked in collusion with big tech in order to censor people, deplatform people. And it was so bad that competition did arise within the sector, right? Rumble, Parler, Truth, others. Here's what that caused. It, it not only created an alternative to those other platforms, even though we, we got to admit those other platforms are much bigger than like Rumble and Truth. But what it did is it also, it put them on notice. It put them on notice. And nothing put them on notice more after things like the Biden Hunter laptop story where they deliberately, deliberately screwed with the news in conjunction with um, the federal government in order to interfere in, in the election. They did this. Um, Elon Musk buying Twitter. That sent shockwaves, I think, through big tech for a couple of reasons. One, now all of a sudden there was guaranteed to be a platform where free speech was actually going to be encouraged. And he wasn't going to just arbitrarily kick off conservatives or libertarians. And the reason why that is so important is because it, it, it caused other large social media platforms like Meta, like YouTube, to actually kind of loosen up on some of the some of the censorship that they were engaging in as well. So the the exposure of what they had been doing combined with Elon Musk buying Twitter combined with other platforms starting to emerge caused I think especially we've noticed it with YouTube and 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 Meta more on Instagram less on Facebook. Facebook algorithm has been garbage lately in my opinion. But but YouTube and uh, Instagram look you you see the topics that we talk about we seldom, if ever, have a video get demonetized or a, or a short get demonetized. I don't think we've received any warnings from, from YouTube. And it's not like we're shying away from major issues. And I give Elon Musk a lot of credit for that. I give the people that came up with Rumble and, and Truth credit because they created that, that social and, more importantly, economic pressure to reevaluate the way they were conducting business. In fact, I think one of the most powerful things Elon Musk did over at Twitter was when he came in, he looked at how they were doing business and then fired 75% of the staff and everybody on the left was like, I'm leaving Twitter and Twitter's going to go to... Twitter's going to go to hell. They're never going to be able to survive with what Elon Musk is doing. And lo and behold... Twitter's thriving. A lot of the leftists that said they were leaving for good left for about five minutes and then couldn't had to cut back for their fix. Right now they're back on X, tweeting away, Xing away, whatever you want to call it. Right. And and they also know this. Elon Musk is now expanding into other uh, other areas. He's using the, the Twitter platform for more than Twitter was just originally set up to be. And now X is engaging more in the podcast, engaging more in the, the live uh, events. When Tucker Carlson let Probably one of the best economic things that could have ever happened to Tucker Carlson was getting fired by Fox News because then he, he takes his show into, into X and other places. He's probably going to make more money <laughs> and he's going to have more freedom to do what he actually wants to do. And so as much as I have a problem with big tech, big tech has actually been pretty responsive uh, in, in many ways to the pushback from the marketplace in a way that you know things like Disney have not been uh, or academia have not been. Um, or the legacy media have not been. I'm going to agree with everything that you said, Nick, and I think Elon definitely, without a doubt, pushed the other platforms to become less um, less negative to conservative views. But I also attack this from a slightly different position, in that I believe TikTok brought Meta, YouTube, and Twitter to their knees with short form video, yeah. and all. All of these platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, saw their viewership spending more time on TikTok and were forced to incorporate short form video into their platforms. And I think this did quite a lot to diversify the content on each platform. And it also forced Facebook to let go of their handle with their tight hand grip on the algorithm. You see less ads in your feed now on Facebook. You see more short form video. The, the uh, competition amongst those platforms forced the other platforms to allow an algorithm which prompted all content to rise to the surface based off of its merit 
as well. And I think that's created a very interesting situation. And the combination of Elon and TikTok has created an environment which has been a lot more friendly to a lot of people. But the last thing I would say is there are a lot of conservatives that say we shouldn't be on TikTok because of China's involvement. And I totally get that. But I think we also need to consider that if we do not operate on TikTok, we will have created or allowed a situation where the left has been able to dominate the platform. And if we are not also putting our message there, could it possibly be that the left loves that this, you know, China being involved with TikTok has discouraged conservatives from being on there because it's just another platform that they can dominate without any competition. And so I think we do need to question the legitimacy of the platform but also examine are we allowing ourselves to, by not being involved to create a situation where the left has complete dominance over the ideas and thinking of gen z and younger people and everyone who is still using the platform i i also think we need to be careful on trying to look for legislative solutions to tiktok like i i under, i genuinely understand we had some stuff in virginia today that i was we had some stuff in virginia this general assembly session that i was willing to consider because I do think that there is a, a significant threat from the idea of essentially the, the Chinese Communist Party owning a platform, which they are deliberately using to, to sow depression and despair among American kids. And, and you can tell this by what TikTok looks like in the United States and by what the equivalent looks like in China. Um, they, they are not pushing the same crap. When, before, before we knew as much as we did about TikTok and, and we had my first account up there, I remember they shut us down. We started to get really popular. We were adding 10,000 followers a day with our content. And then they just shut us down. No real explanation, just done. And what it forced us to do was go onto other platforms and actually build up a viewership there, which was actually very beneficial for us. But the reason why I say we need to be we need to be careful with respect to the sort of legislation is that you might see a bill with really, really good intentions that's trying to target TikTok. And what they will actually do is give the government wide sweeping power across anything that looks like TikTok. And so I'm, I'm not saying that something doesn't need to be done on that. I, I think there's some serious problems with the way that, that TikTok has used their data and used their power and used their exposure. I also think parents need to understand that there's not, a legis there's not some silver bullet legislative fix to this, right? They're going to have to be far more engaged in their children's lives than what they give their children access to, right? There, there is, first and foremost, this is a parental responsibility, Again, not saying that there aren't things that we can do to hold the Chinese Communist Party accountable. I think we need to do that. But I, I desperately don't want to give the government wide sweeping power across all of social media because I promise you that will not work in our favor. Um, the, you know, big tech in Silicon Valley have a degree of power that I think until recently we thought was was unassailable. Mm -hmm. Right. Like they're, oh, they're, how can we stand up to Facebook? How can we stand up to Google? How can we stand up to these these mega corporations that have control over, you know, most of the the, the social media sites that we have out there, especially because in some ways social media is replacing traditional media when it comes to places for you to to get your news in the future. But and, and, and not only that, we've also seen the danger of it, as you pointed out, like in 2020. It was Facebook and Twitter that that shut down, mm -hmm. like explicitly shut down the Hunter Biden laptop story, which, by the way, turned out to be 100 percent true. And so when we talk about things like election interference and stuff like that, that's a clear example of them leveraging their power. This is a private sector institution that is absolutely ideologically captured. I hate to break it to you, but, you know, there's no based red pilled conservatives that are working at Facebook and Google. <laughs> but like. There and until recently at Twitter, right? Yeah. And so we had examples of, oh, the left controls these institutions. In this case, we're talking about big tech in Silicon Valley. They control this institution that has a huge amount of, of outsized influence when it comes to political discourse and discussion, because in some ways they're replacing the old dying media of newspapers and television. And it's going to be even worse than it was with newspapers and television, because at least these jokers in the media, we knew that they were that they weren't with us, right? Yeah. We, we knew that, that you know, ABC and CNN and MSNBC, like we knew that they were ideologically captured and we could also just stop watching them. But you, in some ways you have to use big tech if you live in any place that has access to the internet, if you want to engage with people and more than just how to get your news, but you know, how to sell a product or how to get your ideas across. And 
it's a really dangerous thing when the left controls an institution that doesn't just provide you news, but also is, is a gateway or a mechanism for you to engage in the marketplace, marketplace of ideas or marketplace of goods and services. I mean, our podcast, for example, a huge chunk of our viewership comes through Apple podcast downloads and YouTube. Yeah, It's not like either of those organizations <laughs> or either of those corporations are ideologically in our corner. It's not like they like me. <laughs> but the good news being with Elon Musk purchasing Twitter and then converting it to X and then firing 70% of their staff, two things came across. One, you can fire 70% of the middle management, which are the ones that are usually pushing leftism and wokeism. You could fire most of those people and it still runs great, which sends a message to the investors of somebody like YouTube or Facebook, which is why do we need to kowtow to these radicalized middle management types that are basically pulling the company to the left? We can actually get rid of most of these people and the company will run fine. And increasingly, investors are going to get to a point and you've talked about this before with the rise of interest rates and the explosion of federal deficits and the end of easy money and easy credit, you're going to get to a point where investors are going to be like, where's the returns, man? Yeah. Well, you let, need to let's... replicate YouTube's model. That's the first point. The second point that I'll end with on this is now there's competition in the system, yep. right? Because Twitter is no Twitter went from being our number one enemy because they were the ones that led the charge with censoring the Hunter Biden laptop to Twitter now is is arguably the most friendly to right wing voices of any of these platforms. It's funny, like I trust the I trust the takes of a random Twitter account with an anime <laughs> profile picture that has like a, a, a Christian cross in front of it and, and, and a snake next to it representing Christianity and libertarianism, right? Yeah. I trust the anime profile picture that explicitly says I'm on the right more than I do the the, the Twitter account of the Washington Post, <laughs> right? Like yeah. and so it's it's funny how like Twitter has 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 turned from being the worst out of all of them to the most friendly to conservative voices and in doing so that's that's allowed for competition within the system, which now means that the gatekeepers the, the, the gates have been have been breached, man. Yeah. And now there's competition. And if you're on the right or if you're a conservative, you have a platform that you can go to and that you can help fund if you if you buy like the blue check mark or something like that. You can help fund its success at the expense of these other platforms that now have to compete with Twitter. And they know it. Facebook and YouTube know it. And if if they push too far like they did in 2020 or 2016. What's to say that Elon decides, you know what, we're going to roll out our own equivalent of YouTube now. Yeah, that's that's the part that I think they they in the back of their mind, they understand that Elon Musk is, is one of the best innovators out there and he's also very efficient. So YouTube might be thinking, well, we could do this or Facebook or Meta could be thinking, we would do this. Yeah, but the problem is, is that in many cases, they haven't been that efficient at it. They, they like to, they got to hire all their DEI people. And it turns out that's really expensive. When they asked Elon Musk, like, how are you operating? How are you operating X with 25% of the workforce that Twitter had? He goes, well, it turns out when you don't have a lot of DE or basically when it turns out you don't have a lot of people sitting around looking for ways to censor people, you can run it with a lot less people. And, and again, I think the other things are, they know this and this kind of leads us. we got two more to go. This leads us to wall street. Wall street is another one. And, and to this day, you know, if you, if you listen to Elizabeth Warren, you would think that wall street is just in the pockets of, you know, Republicans and, and, and that's who, they, whereas if you look at every corporate board and you look at the like organizations like BlackRock, BlackRock is firmly, you know, one, one of the most powerful uh, funds out there. They're like firmly in the like far left progressive camp, big Elizabeth Warren fans, I'm sure. Right. And, and they're the ones out there pushing ESG. There's a video of the CEO of BlackRock saying that sometimes behavior has to be forced and we're going to force it. And so for the long time, we we've looked at kind of like, I think we've almost felt like the sense of betrayal that here are the entrepreneurs, here are the businesses, right? And you would think, the businesses would appreciate, you know, a, a ideology which says, hey, you should pay low taxes and you should have fewer regulations and you should be free to run your business in, in the best interest of your customers and your shareholders. And that's and that's it. But no, no, they've completely in, in many cases, not all of them, but in many cases, aligned themselves as hard as they possibly could with the extreme left, not even the moderate left, the extreme left. Tom Cotton, Senator Tom Cotton was at a committee meeting and they were discussing a potential merger between grocery stores. And Tom Cotton gets up there and, you know, the, the representative from the grocery store is there and he goes, he goes, look, 
He goes, I want to tell you guys something. He goes, um, we warned you guys as a grocery store for a long time to not get involved in all of the, the woke progressive political stuff and to just focus on running your business. And you didn't listen to us. And you started firing people over whether or not they would wear your pride pins or whatever else. He goes, and then, and then what happens? You come here to this Senate committee meeting when we're, when we're discussing potentially a, allowing a merger to take place, and you want to rely on those of us who believe in the free market and believe that you should be able to run your business the way you want to save you from what's going on, despite the fact that you want to get involved in others other areas. And then Tom looks at him and goes, so here's what I'm going to say to you. Gosh, I'm really sorry this is happening to you. I hope it works out. And I was like, that was a boss move. Again, Tom Cotton, not my favorite senator, but that was a boss move. I don't think anybody can argue that a lot of people feel that way. It's that you want to sit there and you want to trash the very people that are that are supporting the sort of economic environment that allows you to be able to thrive. And then you want to engage in this crap that like Disney's doing. And, and, then, and then you want to come right back and be like, well, yeah, but you guys are going to help us, right? No, we're not. And I think there's a couple of things that Wall Street has demonstrated recently. One, they can bow. I mean, obviously, they've been bowing to the political pressure of a relatively small sector of the population for, you know, decades now. But really, in the last few years, it's just gotten extreme. It's just gotten ridiculous, right? The month of June has become insufferable, <laughs> Um and, and they're doing all this, but they don't they don't do it in some of their overseas areas, do they? Right? They respond to political pressure. They respond to social pressure. And Ron DeSantis, I mean, the left tried to say, oh, Disney really got the better of Ron DeSantis. No, they did not. Disney capitulated. And and Bob Iger's going around right now. He's not it's not actually manifesting itself in the way Disney operates, but Bob Iger's been doing like an apology tour every five minutes, like, we need to focus more on entertainment. Right. Again, they're not doing it, but they know they got to say it because they're watching their revenues tank. Now, the question is, is how have all of these businesses gotten away with engaging in activity that costs them money? And this fuels into the whole idea of companies like BlackRock that have trillions of dollars that they can invest into companies or trillions of dollars under assets. Right. So they have a lot of power. Well, what does BlackRock do? BlackRock says we want to see your ESG scores. Right. We, we, they are, again, they are pushing the thing. And I've watched companies that are actually very, very conservative say, Nick, I don't know what to do in order to get the funding I need to expand. I have to come up with these ESG criteria or else I'm not going to get the funding. Well, here's a dirty little secret. The only reason why BlackRock has gotten away with a lot of this is not simply because BlackRock's got a ton of money and a ton of assets. BlackRock has been living off of inflationary monetary policy. Right. So these same politicians that are like, ooh, evil corporate America, they're the same ones pushing the inflationary monetary policy, which benefits the legitimately evil companies within corporate America at the expense of the 25 year old that desperately wants to buy their first house. Because when they print that money, it doesn't get distributed equally out to everybody. No, it goes into banks and it goes to places like BlackRock and they get first bite of the apple. And what do they do? They buy up hard assets because they know this dollar is not going to be worth the same that it is when they first get it in their hand. They know the value of that dollar is going down. So what do they do? They go out there and buy hard assets. And and uh, Pierre uh, Pierre Polyev has pointed out yeah. how inflationary monetary policy can can have an oversized impact on the housing market in the sense that if you print a hundred thousand dollars. You've increased the money supply by 100000 But then if you give that 100000 to BlackRock or Vanguard, and then they go out and they overbid $100,000 for a house on a street that has 10 houses, well, because the way that the housing market works, they've now bid 100000 more than what the house was originally worth, which now drives up the price of every home on the block. And so what you've done is you've only increased the money supply by 100000 but you've increased the housing market on this street by collectively a million dollars. And so people point out, well, BlackRock can't have a huge impact on the housing market because their percentage of ownership of homes is actually quite small. And that's true. 
BlackRock only owns, it's like less than 1% of all the houses in the U.S. are owned by a company like BlackRock or Vanguard. And so we, we look at that number and we think, oh, well, they can't have a huge impact. They don't need to own half of all the homes in America to drive up home prices. All they need to do is buy one house on a street and you've now driven up the value of every house on that street. And so the act of some of these these firms that are in you know using real estate as a vehicle for investment in order to blow up the housing market is outsized compared to the amount of money that's actually being pumped into the system through the Federal Reserve's easy money and, and cheap credit policies that they've had for arguably the last 40-something years. But you know what's even more nefarious is that it's not just like the housing market where they're manipulating things. You hinted at it when it came to things like DEI and ESG scores. They've been huge proponents of that. But consider some of the, the previous institutions that we've talked about on this podcast, namely the media and... Um, Silicon Valley, actually three, the media, Silicon Valley, and arts and entertainment. Consider the fact that Wall Street is a huge funder of all three of those. Most media outlets are publicly traded corporations. CNN is owned by Warner Brothers, right? ABC is owned by Disney. Consider the fact that most of Hollywood are publicly traded corporations. Warner Brothers is a publicly traded corporation. Disney is a publicly traded corporation. Universal is a publicly traded corporation. Most of the great film studios in Hollywood, most of the enterprises that are actually churning out the garbage content and, and terrible quality that we've talked about at the very beginning of this podcast, a lot of them were able to get away with what they were doing because of the influx of venture capital funds that were coming from Wall Street. When, when the great inflationary period, when the money printing was in overdrive in 2020 and 2021, a huge amount of that money found its way into Hollywood. Another huge amount of that money found its way into the entertainment and the media sector. And so what you've seen is that in some ways, Wall Street is a mechanism through which some of these other institutions are able to leverage and, and expand their power over the American public when it comes to shaping public opinion and culture. So what happens when Wall Street loses that power? Again, there's a common theme here among most of these institutions that we've talked about. We've brought up five so far. Yep. The common theme is, is that they all have power because we believe they all have power. They all have legitimacy because we have granted them that degree of legitimacy and prestige. Well, and while Wall Street is operating off of our everything from monetary inflationary monetary policy to our investment, our retirement accounts, like that, that's how they get access to massive amounts of money in order to be able to spend it in the ways that they want. What what's the rude awakening? Wall Street will eventually get. It is inevitable. It is inevitable because Wall Street is so inflated based off of inflationary monetary policy for like decades now that they're going to find themselves in a position where sooner or later investors are going to look at people like the CEO of BlackRock and be like, hey, really cute ESG project. Where are the returns on our investment? Or you you are no more, you don't get to play anymore with your little, you know, woke games, your little cultural wars that you want to have in Hollywood or, you know, with, with businesses in general. We want to return on our investment. And again, they've been able to get away with it because of inflationary monetary policy, because of their tight little, their, you know, connections with government. That is that is now starting to be questioned. You saw it in Florida with Ron DeSantis, again, Governor DeSantis saying, hey, we're, we're divesting public funds from uh, BlackRock. And you're starting to see other states follow suit. You're, you're going to see other people probably on the private side going, yep, we want to divest from BlackRock. And, and some are doing it. DeSantis is doing it in part because it's like, fine, you want to play in politics? Well, then pl politics is going to play back. Right? And then the other side, it's going to be on the private sector where it's like, we're not willing to invest our, our, our company or our you know, law enforcement pensions or our whatever it is into a, a program like BlackRock if they're going to prioritize ESG over returns on investment. And that's going to come back to bite them. And what's going to end up happening, and people think, well, oh, you really think you're going to take down BlackRock? Nope, I don't think I got to take down BlackRock. I just think we got to take down the CEOs that are pushing this crap within BlackRock. Because if you have if you have an investor revolt and they kick out whatever CEOs or whatever mid-level management is, is pushing this sort of thing within these investment funds, within these um, uh, hedge funds and et cetera, then what's going to happen is the next person coming in is going to be like, well, I'm going to stay away from that crap. 
right? Because there will have been a, a real consequence to that action. Another thing that I think a lot of these companies are learning is that they used to anticipate that, well, if I don't walk along with the, the progressive narrative on whatever it is and whatever month I've got to celebrate or whatever day I've got to celebrate or whatever you know thing I've got to celebrate, then I'm going to face lawsuits. I'm going to face customer backlash. And what they're finding out is that one, customer backlash works both ways. Don't believe me? Ask Bud Light, right? Ask Bud Light. But the other side too is it's like, look guys, you don't have to wade into this mess. You don't got to wade into this mess. You can just focus on doing what you should have always focused on, which is providing a quality service or product to your customers. And again, I think investors, um, I think shareholders are going to start to punish these people. And one of the easiest ways they can do it is because of what Ron DeSantis is doing. If you're an investor in Disney right now, you should be looking at Bob Iger. Like if you're a serious shareholder in, in, um, in Disney, you should be looking at Bob Iger going, what the hell is your problem? What the hell is your problem? You keep picking fights, which nobody asked you to pick, except for maybe some of your mid-level management that you should consider getting rid of because they've done zero for you when it comes to actual creative money-making things within Disney. Like all of the, all the little woke space cadets you've hired have, have been done a really good job at destroying beloved IP right? What the hell are you doing? And so honestly, I think more governors are going to stand up and stick it to BlackRock and stick it to some of these other organizations. I think investors are going to revolt. And I think the other thing too is more people are going to rise up in order to compete with these funds that are currently very, very powerful, but are honestly engaging in bad business practices. And the problem is, is they've relied so heavy on the U.S. dollar being the reserve currency. They've relied so heavily on inflationary monetary policy. And again, that is not basing your, you, you may have to operate in a world where those things take place. You can't ignore them. But when you start to base your entire business model on that, instead of sound economic policy and sound business policy, well, I got news for you when the policy changes, because inevitably it has to, you're going to be sucking, man. And your competition's going to eat your lunch. And I'm here for it, baby. <laughs> oh, I, I am too. Because I, what, what what's funny is, is that just like how Wall Street is indirectly or in some cases directly fueling the left-wing control over some of these other institutions that we've talked about, they also rely on the federal government in order to give them a degree of outsized power and influence that they would otherwise have, namely when it comes to the Federal Reserve's monetary policy, which I think brings us to the last and arguably the head of the Leviathan, the most dangerous and most powerful of them all, because all these institutions... They have two things in common. We, I hinted at one of them, right? They all have power because we say they have power. They yep. all have legitimacy because we kind of agreed they do. And so in some ways it's an illusion. But you know what? The IRS agent, there's no illusion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they have yeah. power. I, I've asked that question once when somebody will be complaining about like, oh, the, you know, big business is too powerful or, or like, you know, Elon Musk, you know, shouldn't have that much money. He's too powerful. Like if Elon Musk showed on my porch right now and demanded a thousand dollars, I would kick his ass off my porch. Right. But if an IRS agent showed up and demanded a thousand dollars, I'd be worried. I'd probably be getting my checkbook. Right. Because I don't want to go to jail. And that's the problem that the federal bureaucracy has. And it's a reason why it was never meant to be this big. It was never meant to be this powerful. It was never meant to be this intrusive in, in any number of, of decisions, which were always meant to be left to the individual or at the very least the states. Right, never the federal government, but yet the federal bureaucracy has grown. We've talked about this with the 16th Amendment, with the 17th Amendment, with the Federal Reserve, all of that being kind of the beginning of the massive growth of federal bureaucracy, and and that fueling the the inflationary monetary policy. Because one of the biggest things that fuels that policy, and both parties, both parties have been guilty. The difference is, for one party, it's just going along with what they actually believe. For the other party, it's a betrayal of their stated principles, right? I'll let you guess which one's which. But what this really comes down to is we are now seeing a massive push like uh, Donald Trump. And, and regardless of where Donald Trump you know, fits with you on, on your ideal political candidate, Donald Trump recognized something in his first term that I have never seen another president recognize to the full extent that he has. And that is the federal bureaucracy has the power to slow roll your agenda all day long. You can pass whatever laws you want. You can make whatever executive orders you want. But if the federal bureaucracy wants to slow roll it, they can do so with very little consequence. Most people think that the president, well, okay, I get it. He's not the CEO of the entire government because we have separation of powers and we have the legislative branch and the judicial branch. But surely, 
Surely he's the head of the executive branch. Well, yeah, technically, but that doesn't mean he can fire whoever he wants within the executive branch. And the end result has been that we have this massive federal bureaucracy that has not only grown in, in scope um, and extent, they've also grown in power. They have the ability to write regulations which have the force of law. You know, you, you, have, you have people in Congress that will write some broad piece of legislation and then they will grant just about unlimited regulatory power to an executive branch agency to create regulations that have the force of law under that bill, but that no person in Congress, none of your representatives have actually voted on any of those individual regulations. They didn't even know what was going to go on into existence when they voted for the bill in the first place. That's how absurd this has gotten. And it has allowed the federal government, it has allowed the Federal Reserve, it has allowed politicians to be able to try and manipulate the economy to the benefit of their reelection. That's what this comes down to. And th this is going to be one of the hardest to tackle, right? All the others, we've got a lot more ability to tackle it through competition or through changing the way that we consume products or changing our, our, our behaviors and the way that we view the value of some of these institutions, which used to have great value and have now lost it. When it comes to the federal bureaucracy, they're the one institution that we've talked about today that has the legal authority to use force to get what they want. And this is the area, you know, this is the area where politics matters. Right, Who you put as the chief executive matters. And I think we're going to get into a very, very interesting situation in the not-so-distant future where the power of the federal bureaucracy is challenged in a way it has never been challenged before. And God bless it, it couldn't come soon enough. Because when, when people start to recognize that we do not need this huge federal apparatus, that, that not only is it not important to your day-to-day -day life, it's detrimental to it. That's going to be the time where we're like, here's, here's what I would love Donald Trump to do. So civil service laws prevents um, uh, the president from just being to, you know, willy-nilly fire whoever he wants within the executive branch. And that was set up to prevent the spoils system. That's a conversation for a different day. I would love for Donald Trump to do what Joe Biden is doing right now with college loans and say, okay, fine. If we're just going to ignore what we want to ignore, then I'm firing huge swaths of the federal government that I don't, I don't believe are providing anything of real benefit to the American people. All they're doing is living off the fruits of the labor of taxpayers. So I'm firing them. And then let's say the Supreme Court says, well, actually, this is a violation of civil service laws. You can't do that. They need a change in the law. I think Donald Trump should immediately go to Congress and say, I want a change in the law. I'm not signing anything until you send me a law dealing with this federal bureaucracy. But in the meantime, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pay them. All right, they legally can't be fired. Fine. I'm, I'm going to pay them. And they're not fired, but we're locking the building. And I don't want any of them to come into work. Because here's what I think would happen. I think... Millions of Americans, tens of millions of Americans would be fascinated to find out that not only did their absence from doing their duties, again, not make your life worse, it actually made your life better. It made it easier to run your business. It made it easier to educate your kids. It made it easier to do any number of things that, again, either federal bureaucrats or, or agents are constantly interfering in. And what would happen at that point is people would, people would become furious with the idea that why are we paying people to sit at home? Because paying them to sit at home is actually better than paying them to do the job that the federal government currently has them doing. And that's the point where people will finally come to the realization that, oh my gosh, this is a colossal waste of money to make my life worse. Yes. Yes, it is, baby. And we, you can not only get that money back or, or reinvest it in something else if you want, but I, I think that would, that would be one of the things that would really question the power of the bureaucracy. And never forget this. The number one driver in, of inflation, inflationary monetary policy is the federal government's desire to spend money without taxing it or borrowing it. Right? If they can just spend more money by printing it, that's a pretty easy thing. And then they are happy to let the next politician deal with the problems because that's that politician's reelection problem, not their reelection problem. So I think we're coming to a point where people are starting to properly understand the true nature of inflation. It's not the Elizabeth Warren version of it where like companies are just greedy. R really, really, Liz? So, so what? The company just got more greedy today and that's why my prices went up. It has nothing to do with printing $3 trillion. It has nothing to do with the federal government constantly spending more money that it didn't earn and it took from taxpayers. Nothing to do with any of that, huh? Just greed. 
No, people aren't buying that narrative anymore. They're pushing back against inflation. They're pushing back against the proper source of inflation, right? And we're starting to have more people set up. And the number one best example of a chief executive that has actually promised he would do it and made good at it, Javier Malay in Argentina. Holy crap. I'm not in favor of human cloning, but I might make it an exception for that dude. That guy came in. He said, he ran on, I'm going to cut all these federal agencies within the Argentine government because all they're doing is living off the, the, the work of taxpayers, and it's wrong. It is wrong that a taxpayer has to pay for the privilege of having his life made worse by the same bureaucrat that's going to come in and make it harder for him to run his business. We're getting rid of these people. Right? And it was, oh, you can't do this. <laughs> he cut the number of ministries in Argentina from 22 to nine, like on his second day in office. He's firing 70,000 federal employees down there. And guess what? People are on board with it because they fail to see the benefit of what all of these, these public servants are actually doing. Not to mention the fact that I think everybody has gotten really tired of being told by politicians and bureaucrats alike that the only reason why these grandiose ideas from politicians aren't working is because taxpayers haven't given enough of their money to the government. Nobody's buying that crap anymore. And I'm, again, I'm here for it. I'm here for it. So I think those are the two things that are going to really, again, why has why is the bureaucracy fallen out of favor? They've done it to themselves. Why is Wall Street fallen out of favor? They've done it to themselves. Why the media? Why academia? Why big tech? They've done it to themselves. And in the process of doing it, they've shown us how we're going to fight back and how we're going to do it effectively. And out of the six categories we've talked today, five of them, five of them, you get to be a part of that process right now without having to vote, without having to run for office, without having to show up to a school board meeting. It has to do with what you prioritize. It has to do with just looking for the alternatives that have now arisen and presented themselves and want you as customers. They want to do business with you. They don't hate your values. We just got to choose to do business with those companies. We got to do choose to do business with those institutions. You don't got to give up on your dreams of doing certain things because the gatekeepers at higher ed are preventing you from doing so. You don't got to give up on your dreams. You just got to look for an alternative institution which, is, which wants to educate you. If you're the sort of person running a company, start looking around and, and, and gosh, at this point, it's not even taking a chance. It's a better bet to go with the person that is on board with your mission, wants you to be successful because it means success for them and has capabilities. Maybe they don't have the credential. Do they have the capability? Do they have the aptitude? Do they have the right mindset? I guarantee you you're going to get far more value out of training that person to do the job than you are importing someone, importing an activist from an institution of higher education that was more concerned about teaching them woke ideology than they were the actual skill sets necessary for them to thrive and for your business to thrive. When, when it comes to the media, there's any number of sources that you can go to now in order to get your information. When it comes to Wall Street, there's alternatives with respect to how you invest. So look, all of this to say, I am like wildly encouraged. This, this is one of the most positive conversations that, that Chris and I have had in a while when I'm looking at this going, they're afraid because they're starting to see that people are not putting up with this anymore. And, and the, here's the last part I want to end on. And this specifically goes out to, to, young, to young women and young men. And, and young men, I want to, young, young women, listen, I'm going to tell you something right now. You have been fed a bill of goods. And, and more and more women are starting to recognize in their, in their late 20s and their early 30s that that's exactly what it was. They feel lonely. They feel isolated. All the things that they were told were supposed to bring them meaning as opposed to having a husband or a family are not getting the job done. Yeah, there's some out there that will brag about how, how happy they are to wake up whenever they want and not have to worry about kids. And Okay, and, and maybe they are. And maybe they are, but what we're finding is most people are not. And then you see a bunch of liberal women out there talking about, well, why, are, why is it only the conservative men that have the sort of attributes I want? I saw another one today on Twitter. It's like, well, I just went off birth control and I'm no longer uh, attracted to my boyfriend. Well, yeah, it turns out, it turns out when you're not poisoning yourself, you're not attracted to the sort of people that woke ideology is telling you to be attracted to. So here's all I'm going to say. If you're a younger woman and you're watching this, I'm not telling you to believe everything I'm saying because I'm saying it. I'm not telling you to adopt everything that, that I'm, I'm suggesting right now. What I am asking is that you be open to consideration that a lot of the forces that have, that have convinced you 
that what your life should be is something very, very different than what a lot of those traditional choices associated with, with, with marriage or raising kids, not at the exclusion of a career, but understanding that being married and having kids is important to the vast majority of women. Maybe, maybe the reason why they're pushing it, maybe the reason they want you single in your 40s and 50s is because they want you angry. Because an angry woman that feels isolated becomes a very, very effective advocate for the sort of ideology and the political power that they're pushing for. When it comes to young men, here's what I'm going to tell you. Young men, you are being you are being afforded three options right now. One option is to just go along to be the sort of, 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 of simp that just can't wait to agree with whatever the latest edict is of the fourth wave feminist. You, you can't wait to kowtow and talk about how horrible men are. And you just can't wait to be as docile as possible because that's what you've been told is lacking within society. Weak, pathetic men that just do what they're told. And, and most men are looking at that going, no, I don't think so. But the question is, is what do you do next? Do, do, you go, do you go one route where now it's just about betting as many women as you possibly can, making as much money as you can, basically taking out all your anger and frustration on a society and on an ideology that told you that you needed to be weak, that told you that every instinct that you had toward genuine masculinity was wrong and toxic and bad and the source of all evil in the world? Is that what you're going to do? Or... Are you going to choose an approach where I'm going to tell you right now, we need young men to be able to save what's going on right now. And I'm not going to tell you it's going to be easy. And I'm not even telling you it's, it's fair or just that you have to do it. But I am telling you that you have to do it. Or the result is going to be even worse than the current status quo. More than ever, more than ever, what I'm going to tell young men out there is that I want you to look at everything that's being thrown at you from arts and entertainment, from the media, maybe from the, the school that you're at, maybe for the university that you're at, um, from the gender studies professor. I want you to look at all of it and just look back and be like, yeah, sorry, don't buy it. Don't care. Demonstrate confidence, demonstrate strength. And, and I don't mean arrogance. I don't mean misogyny. I mean genuine strength and confidence that comes from making yourself more capable. Because I promise you, I promise you, there are women out there that really appreciate that, know exactly what it was, and they want it. There's a lot of other women that are going to realize later that they want it. And unfortunately, some of them are going to realize way too late that that's what they wanted all along. But if young men aren't stepping up to actually fulfill that role within society, it isn't going to get better. It's only going to get worse. And I'm telling you, this version of masculinity that reduces masculinity to nothing more than the quest for power and pleasure is in and of itself corrosive and destructive, but choosing to be a good, honorable man that quite frankly doesn't put up with this crap, doesn't buy it, but by the same token develops themselves spiritually, intellectually, emotionally, physically, and professionally, you are going to have more to do with saving our society and saving this country than arguably anybody else, but only if you choose that path. The good news is, as we're looking at everything to dear and we're, as we're doing the analysis, and, and, and if you've watched this before, you know Christian isn't, isn't predisposed to optimism. <laughs> We're looking at all this right now, and it's like we see a path. I'm going to go back to that Rocky, IV re that Rocky IV reference, right? It's that point in the movie where Rocky's just getting pummeled and pummeled and pummeled, and then he pulls off a shot, and all of a sudden it's the Russian's cut, the Russian's cut. And he sits down on that stool in the middle of the round, and his trainer comes over and says, do you see he's not a machine, he's a man. You can do this. It can be done. That doesn't mean it's not, that doesn't mean it's going to be done without pain or without challenges or without defeats in the process, but it can be done if we have the will to do it and we choose the right path in order to accomplish it. The Leviathan is not invincible. Nope. It can be slayed. The Leviathan is cut. It bleeds. <laughs> all right. Well, listen, we hope that, um, we hope that you found this informative and, and most of all, I really hope that you found this encouraging because there has been a lot of stuff. We don't, we don't try to sugarcoat the stuff that's going badly, but we do always try to leave people with a way that they can actually fight back against it and fight back. I, let me put it this way. The best fighters, are the ones that fight for what they love, not fight against what they hate. And there's a lot to love about our society. There's a lot to love about what we believe. There's a lot to love about the people within our lives that bring us meaning and that bring us purpose. There's a lot to love about the objective reality and objective morality that God has given us. 
And if we're willing to take up that mantle and fight, I really think that we're living in a, in a time where we can come out on the other side of this and say, when it was our turn to do our duty, we did it. And as a result, our kids and our grandchildren get to grow up in the sort of country that we want for them. Once again, thank you for joining us on Making the Argument, and we'll see you next episode.